Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you? That was pathetic. How are you guys? Good. All right. Well, it is a smaller crowd because of the weather, right? We got people coming in, but um, it's good to see you guys. I'm glad I'm not stuck and snowed in at home, but uh, there was a lot worse out there, I'll tell you that, out where I live. Anyway, um, we have a new uh, core value that we are going to focus on this month. Uh, we've looked at joy. We have looked at spiritual sensitivity in our walk with the Lord, and this time we're going to look at modeling Christ. Modeling, you guys are probably thinking like of a, a runway show with <laughs> fancy designer wear. That, not that kind of modeling. The modeling that is um, us living out Christ-likeness, right? To be like Christ, to follow Christ. And, and the idea is that we'll have an impact on the world by the way that we live. Um, so, Paul praised the Thessalonians for this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says this, uh, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, so of the apostles and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became a model or an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you. So the idea is that they became like Jesus, and in so doing, they became a model or an example to other people, maybe unbelievers, but also to other churches. And so that's kind of the heart of what we're talking about here, just growing in Christ-likeness, modeling Christ. And let's, let's pray uh, before we get started, Lord, uh, thank you just for today, the opportunity to be here. Uh, we know there are several people who cannot be here. They're uh, stuck at home because they live a, a distance away or they live out in the country. Um, we pray that uh, they would find worship as well, maybe on, online or in your word today with you. Uh, but this morning, we come and we, uh, we just come with hearts of worship. And hearts that want to learn, hearts that want to grow, uh, that want to experience uh, life with you and to be transformed by the gospel. Um, use this church service, this time, to make us more and more like Jesus, that we might uh, imitate him and be a model uh, to others and what it's like to walk with Jesus, that we might bring hope and um, and even some curiosity to the world as they see the difference that, that Christ has made in our lives. Uh, and we just commit this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand to get ready to sing this morning. And we'll start off with a scripture reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It reads, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And that, I don't think, is the right scripture reading for that song, for the first song, but that's what came up anyway. Fears breathe. 
Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Blessed assurance is mine. Oh, what a poor taste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day. heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast away from me your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Three. 
Create in me a clean heart, O oh, 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 God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore within me create in me a clean heart oh, oh God and renew a right spirit within me create in me a And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore And renew a right spirit within me. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the long greetings this morning. Praise the Lord. Oh, we do, don't we?
I know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, good morning, folks. Good to see you. Uh, for announcements, announcements this morning, we've got fellowship dinner back there. Um, oh. Going to be a smaller one, apparently. The weather kept a lot of people home. It's funny to go from Easter Sunday to this, right? So Easter, I saw a joke online. I don't know if I should share it, right? Easter Sunday, empty tomb. The next week, empty pew. <laughs> but it doesn't help when you got the weather uh, acting like it is. We had six or eight inches out at our house. I mean, it was a struggle. I had to use four-wheel drive just to get out here. And then I get into, t you know, a mile or two outside of town, and I'm like, oh, that's a different world. So I'd be careful out there. Uh, we're right on the edge of this thing, so it's doing some weird things. But anyway, fellowship dinner, stay uh, for that if you want to. We've got um, also a board meeting on Thursday, this Thursday, not Tuesday. So f from here on out... Uh, as, as far as we know, those are going to be on Thursday nights now, 7 p.m. Everybody's welcome. We've got awards night for Awana on April 17th. Only two more weeks. Can you believe it? Two more weeks of Awana left, and then we are we're done. But April 17th awards night is not just for Awana people this year. We have... A couple of evangelistic comedians. Uh, I always get their names wrong. It's like Mike and Ike or Mick and Vic or Vic and Rick. I don't know, but they're coming, and uh, they've been in our area before. You might remember them 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, people really enjoyed them, and they're coming back. So uh, please come to awards night during Awana. Uh, you'll get to hear a, a funny uh, presentation. They also share the gospel with it. So be aware of that. And then uh, as far as the, the board affirmations were going to take place today, I was talking to a couple of people during the Sunday school hour, and we had, you know, I, I kept getting texts from people saying, we're going to be gone, we're going to be gone, we're not going to make it. And we just decided, let's just postpone that a week because we have so many people missing. Um, if that's all right, we'd like to postpone that one more week. So I hope that's all right with you guys. Just way too many people um, gone this morning for that. But let's go ahead and pray, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning uh, with, with grateful hearts, so thankful for um, 
just the opportunity to to know you, to um, to to be in a relationship with you. Uh, uh, just amazing to think that we can know the one true God, and that we can really um, experience you in this life here and now. We don't have to wait for heaven. And I pray that as a church we'd be aware of that, and uh, through our relationship with you, as we as we build that relationship, you'd help us to become uh, more and more like our Savior Jesus all the time, uh, to become more and more like Christ so that we model him to the world and so that the world sees the hope and love and the joy and the peace that, that Jesus can bring into our lives. Uh, we praise you for the, the moisture we're receiving this morning after the dry winter um, which we're not complaining about. <laughs> um, we're just thankful for the moisture that we've received uh, recently. Uh, it's going to be a blessing to our area. pray that it would be a blessing to all of the farmers and ranchers out there and, and even just the flowers that just make it a beautiful place to live. So um, we're thankful for it all. We're thankful for the way you continue to provide uh, for our church family, for all of the missionaries, for meeting different needs in our community, and even beyond. And we just ask for wisdom um, to steward your resources wisely. We thank you for the, the recent baptisms, the couple of baptisms we had last week. What a joy that was. Um, that was that was fun. That was refreshing. Um, thank you for the, the testimonies that we heard. And, and we pray that our testimonies would continue to be heard um, in, in Shadron and, and beyond. And that because of our testimony, others would, uh, would follow Jesus as well, and that we would invite them to do that. Uh, but we don't want to just uh, come here on Sunday morning, hear the truth, and go home. We want to we be changed. We want to see people uh, get saved. We want to see lives changed. We want to see new people come to Jesus for the first time and decide to follow Him. And we are... We're reliant upon you for that, Lord, but help us to be your mouthpieces and, and just to, um, to build bridges with people who need you and help us to slow down enough to share the gospel uh, with folks. And uh, I just pray for our Awana leaders and our Sunday school teachers as they start to wrap up the year. We pray that they would finish strong and uh, that you would Continue to give them the, the thoughts and the words to lead and, and the courage to do so, but also um, lead us into the next season that is coming up in, in late spring and summer. Uh, be with us as the board meeting uh, starts to think about a little bit more uh, summer and, and just the next season that we're going to be entering into here shortly and just all of the plans uh, that go along with it. We come to your word this morning uh, with open eyes, open ears, hopefully open hearts, Lord, wanting to hear a good word from you. Use your word like, like honey to, uh, to sweeten our souls up. Sometimes we need that uh, to lift our spirits. Use it to and encourage us in our walk with Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. All God's people said... Amen. All right, well, we've been talking this Easter about what Easter means for our lives in the here and the now. So we've, we've talked about the crown and how Jesus is our king. We've talked about the cross and how the cross is the way to life but it's also the way of life. We take up our cross and we follow Jesus. And then last week we looked at the empty tomb and you and how the empty tomb means a brand new life now and it means an, an eternal inheritance forever with God. Okay, but there's more to that because... And we're, we're going to continue. This is our last week in this, this series, but I want to continue talking about the empty tomb and you because 
if these things are true, and they are, well, that means that we have a great mission ahead of us, right? We have a great task to tell others about this good news and invite them into this wonderful journey with Jesus as well. Help others to come to know Jesus and to walk in the newness of life with Him. Um, if you've experienced this new life in Christ, well then you know that there's nothing more important that this world needs to hear than the good news of Jesus. And so we have a new mission. The empty tomb means a new mission. And deep down, I think we all desire to be part of, of, a, of a mission that's greater than ourselves, something that's greater than ourselves, something that's going to outlast our life on earth to be part of something that's going to matter for forever. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our hearts beat for something more than just the nine to five and the weekend. Am I right? Right? We long for something different, something grand, something glorious, to be part of a mission or a purpose of some kind that's making a difference in the world, that's restoring lives, that's restoring relationships, bringing hope and love and joy and peace to people. Um, seeing people restored to God through it. I think we all long for that, right? I hope we long for more than just a football game on a Friday night or something like that. There's only one problem, though. So many of us feel incapable or unworthy of being used by God for such a purpose. I think a lot of us live under a blanket of shame or guilt because of our past or what we've done in our past, and we look at ourselves introspectively and we ask, how could God use me? Right? I'm, a, I'm a mess. God knows me. God knows my failures. He knows my weaknesses. He knows everything I've done. He, he knows what I'm going to do. He knows I've failed him in the past. He knows I'm going to fail him in the future. So why would God ever consider using me? Why would God want to use me? You know, I think, personally, I'll trust Christ, but I really think I'm better off just sitting on the bench, on the sidelines, cheering other people on who have it all together. Well, let's talk about that way of thinking this morning from John 21. John chapter 21 says this in verse 1, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, also known as the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. All night long they caught nothing. So John says here, just introducing this chapter, that he's about to tell us one of the mes many resurrection accounts of Jesus. And this is, this is my favorite of them all. Uh, at this point, Jesus has been, he's been raised, right? He's the, I mean, the empty tomb is, is clear. He's appeared to some of his disciples. They're aware of that. Um, the feast is now over in Jerusalem, and they've made their way back up north. Into, the, into Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus said he would appear to them. And they're there just waiting for further instruction, made it, waiting for the Spirit to come like Jesus said. And the disciples, um, at this point, you have to imagine, are just kind of feeling like they're in limbo. They're kind of confused, uh, probably uh, uncertain, uncertain about what the future Holds, they're just kind of waiting around for more instruction in limbo. Um, however, there's, there's one disciple in particular 
who is in one of his darkest moments in life. It's Peter. Right? Peter's soul has to be in anguish because the night, during the night of Jesus' arrest, around a, a charcoal fire, Peter looked out for number one and he denied Jesus three times. And he knows that Jesus knows. Because when Peter actually basically called down a curse from heaven in his defense saying, I swear I do not know that man. At that moment, Peter was close enough to Jesus that Jesus heard it and he looked right at him, Luke tells us. And at that moment, Peter was crushed because he told Jesus, even if everybody else falls away from you, I never will. So now here's Peter, emotionally tapped out, going back to fishing, as once confident spirit is now suffocating under the weight of his failure to his Lord. You ever feel like that? I have more than once. One of the things that we do when we're in a moment like that is that we just want to go back to what's familiar, I think. We want to go back to fishing. We, we just want to try to do, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I think if you're in a dark place, you're in a, you know, I think the worst thing you can do is sit on the couch at home and do nothing or lay in bed and do nothing. It's better to be doing something. Doing what's familiar, that's fine. I think it's better than sitting there twiddling your thumbs waiting for Jesus. Get in the boat, go fishing. But the, the problem here is, is that um, I have a feeling this fishing is an escape. In a, in a way. Um, Peter and some of the other, dis for, some of the, for Peter and some of the other disciples, um, fishing was uh, what they did for a living. And it was something that they did at night, customarily. Uh, they go fishing all night long, and I have, to, I have to imagine Peter sitting there thinking, I'd love to step out on the water again. I'd love to follow Jesus again. I'd love to be a leader for Jesus again. I, I, I'm, but I'm convinced Jesus could never use me again. Maybe, maybe you can relate to that sort of feeling that Peter is feeling. You've blown it. Um, you've failed. And you're wondering if God still has your back. Um, or if he's repulsed by you and doesn't want anything to do with you. And you're thinking about throwing in the towel, walking away for good, maybe going back to what's familiar, sitting on the bench. Convinced that uh, your service for the Lord is over. Or maybe you have gone back to what is familiar. You're already on the bench and you've experienced what these disciples experienced. That failure is contagious. They went fishing all night. They caught nothing. Um, I think we can all relate. If you've gone fishing with me, you definitely can relate. Uh, the only thing worse than not smelling like fish at the end of a fishing trip is coming home empty-handed. Right? I'd rather smell like fish than not at the end of a fishing trip. One man said, though, failure is infectious. And pretty soon, we find ourselves failing at everything we touch until we finally feel like I can't do anything right. You ever felt like that? Just can't do anything right. Why do I even try? It's just one more reason to sit on the bench. But deep down, I imagine that just like Peter, your heart longs to get off the bench and to be used by God. You don't really want it to end that way, do you? Even in your darkest moments, you know that Sitting on the bench is not God's will for your life. You long for redemption. You long for restoration. You want a redemption story to come out of this. 
And as much as the voice in your head wants to throw a pity party and say, I'm done, I'm never going to try again, you don't really want it to end that way deep down. And I don't want that for you. You also understand, if you've experienced life with Jesus, you know that life without Jesus and without service to him is a lot like the disciples' nets that morning. Empty. That's life without Jesus. I mean, you can pursue happiness in the things of the world. You can try to go back to what's less risky. That's what we tend to do when we fail. We, we, we lessen, right, the risk factor. I'm going to go back to what's familiar. You can even go fishing, okay, <laughs> today. But without Jesus, even fishing is empty. No matter how many fish you catch. It's not what it should be, because our joy is in Christ, and if we're not with Him, we're not living for Him. It doesn't matter how many fish we catch. I read a quote recently that, that said this, Many men go fishing all of their lives without knowing that it's not a fish they are after. I like that. A lot of men go fishing all of their lives without knowing it's not a fish that they're after. Well, let's keep reading in verse 4 through 14 here. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And so Jesus said to them, Children, do you not have any fish, do you? You do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net, on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. And so they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who's that? John, who's writing this? Don't you love that? Said to Peter, it is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it in bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him. Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took the bread and gave it to them. And the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So again, this has to be one of my favorite scenes in all of Scripture. I would have loved to have been there that morning. I mean, just think about that. You, Jesus, the disciples, sitting on the beach in the morning having breakfast. Doesn't that sound fun? Doesn't that sound relaxing? No crowds, no cameras, just you and Jesus having breakfast on the beach with a few of your closest friends. I would have loved to have been there that morning. It's a moment they're going to remember forever. But we also see kind of this, this fun and mysterious unpredictable side of Jesus, don't we? He's just sort of hanging out with them, having fun, kind of toying with them, 100 yards away on the beach, and, uh, he, but he's going to disciple them too. He's, it's, it's a fun side of Jesus, I think, that we see here. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I long for this sort of slightly unpredictable, mysterious and adventurous journey with Jesus. As much as I hate surprises sometimes, because sometimes surprises are 911 calls and things like that, 
um, bad surprises. I like to wonder, though, about what's, what's around the next corner in my journey with Jesus. I like that adventurous side of walking with God and wondering what's next. What's he calling me to? How's he going to show up in my life today? How's he going to speak to me today? Is it going to be while I'm driving down the road, while I'm in his word, while I'm at work or at lunch? Something like that. I mean, how's God going to break through in my life today in a surprising way? Do you still have that sort of relationship with God where it's just kind of, it's fun? Kind of surprises you now and then? There's an individual in our town I've been running into a lot, like four or five times this month. I never see them, and now all of a sudden I see them all the time, and I was like, man, God keeps putting this person in my path. And I'm going to talk to him. And I talked to him at a, at a coffee shop or the ice cream shop the other day and, and then at the soccer game. And God used that person through our conversation just to speak to me, you know, just to, to encourage me. And I went home thinking, I got to put that in my journal, you know. It was, a, it was a, a thin moment where it seemed like God was there. He's speaking to me. He's working in my life. God put that person in my path to minister to me through our conversations. But if I had been so busy that I couldn't slow down and speak with this person, well, then I would have missed it entirely. So I like to think that throughout the day, we need to keep our eyes and our ears alert to the way that, that God might be trying to get our attention that day. I've been working on that a lot lately. But the disciples recognized Jesus that day, um, and, and, and they recognized him, even though it was a unique way that he showed up, right? He's, he's off on the beach in the distance. They couldn't really tell it was him. But uh, they did know, though, it had to be him because of this request that they'd heard before. The request of, put your nets on the other side of the boat. You know, three years ago in Luke chapter 5, the same thing happened. This was early on in Jesus' ministry. Um, the, the crowds were pressing in on him, and so Jesus decides, I'm going to get in one of these fishermen's boat. These fishermen had been out all night, they had caught nothing. <laughs> and Jesus, and they've washed their nets while he was teaching and preaching. Well, now they're done, so he says, I'm going to get in this boat. Guess whose boat it was? It was Simon's, Simon Peter's boat that he got into, and he was preaching to the crowds. And he told them that time, he said, put the nets down again. And Peter's like, Master, <laughs> I like you and all, but we've been out all night. We haven't caught a thing. He says, put the nets down. And so they do it. And the nets are so full that other people hop in their boats, push out, and they have to try and help. And the boats become so full that they're almost sinking. And it's at that point that Peter says, get away, away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful human being. I'm a sinful man. So he recognized at that point, three years ago, after the same request, Jesus was the Messiah. That this ain't, this ain't normal, what he just did. We've never caught fish like this before, especially after a night of nothing. And what does Jesus say to Peter? He says, do not fear, from now on you're going to be catching fish people instead. And so Peter, realizing, right, flashbacks to three years ago, this is the Lord. He did it again. <laughs> he jumps into the water and he swims to Jesus, just kind of leaves the other guys to do the work. He doesn't care about the fish. He just cares about the Lord. And so impulsively, Peter hops in the water, swims to Jesus. And there's a point that I don't want to miss from this, this portion of Scripture, there's a lot we could talk about. I know I'm missing a lot of details, but I want to bring out one point, and it's that Jesus did not need the disciples. The disciples needed him. And that's evident by the way that they didn't catch any fish unless Jesus was there and a part of it. Without Jesus, they didn't catch any fish. With Jesus, they caught a boatload 
of fish. And what's interesting is when they get to shore, Jesus already has fish cooking on the fire, already made up. And he says, bring the fish which you have now caught. So, without him, again, the point is, we can do nothing. We catch nothing, but with him, we can. And the point is, when it comes to the mission of telling the world about Jesus, of making disciples, we have to rely on Jesus to fulfill that mission. The empty tomb means a new mission, but we have to rely on Jesus to fulfill that mission. It's not going to be done in our own power, in our own strength, in our own self-determination. That's a lesson that Peter's learning the hard way. Actually, I just heard someone say this morning, right before the service started, there's two ways to learn, one through teachability, the other way through pain. (laughs) Peter's learning through pain. You've got to rely on Jesus to fulfill this mission. Well, I can't miss this point. John says, we caught 153 fish. Some people want to try and find some sort of special meaning in that. Um, I tend to think it's there just to say, hey, look, this really happened, and here's how many fish we caught. Here's how many fish we took to the market that day. We made buco dollars that day off the fish. But uh, because that's what they were doing. It was, it was commercial fishing, basically. But it also could be John's way of bragging, right? I mean, he's a fisherman. You can't tell me fishermen today are much different than fishermen 2,000 years ago. He's saying, here's how many fish we caught, right? And he's lucky in Game and Parks. Israeli Game and Parks didn't show up that morning, and <laughs> they probably broke the fishing limit. But uh, let's keep reading in verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I think that's saying, do you, do you really love me more than these other disciples like you said you did? Well, Jesus said to him, yes, Lord. Or sorry, Peter said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. So there's a lot going on here. One we want to take notice of what what Jesus calls Peter. What's he call him? Does he call him Peter? He, no, he calls him Simon, son of John, which is Peter's name before he met Jesus. Remember in the Gospels, after um, I think it's after Peter made his great announcement that Jesus was the Messiah, he says, you, your name is Simon, but from now on you're going to be called Peter, which means rock. Uh, It's like going from pebble to rock, like a boulder. But um, I think it it fits Peter's characteristics um, and his role in the church to be a rock for Jesus. Um, And to, to go back to Simon had to be pretty humiliating. It had to sting a bit. It had to be humbling for Jesus to call him by his name that he was called before Christ. Peter, he's the one, remember, that professed Jesus was the Messiah. He said, I'll never, even if everybody else fails you, I won't. In the Garden of Gethsemane, though, we start to see his downfall through prayerlessness, right? Right? He wouldn't stay up and pray. And basically, Peter eats humble pie for trying to live for Jesus in his own self-sufficiency and pride and determination. And I think he just learned a valuable lesson, is that we fail when we don't rely on him. And then Jesus asks Peter three times if he loves him. A common thing, I think, in Jewish culture, 
And, and there's a lot of people who want to make a big deal out of the use of, of the Greek words here. Uh, so you've probably heard it before that there's three different types of words in Greek for love. You've got agape, phileo, and eros, right? So agape is usually stated as being a self-sacrificial love. Um, you've got phileo, which means like more of a brotherly and admirable love. Like uh, Philadelphia means city of brotherly love, phileo love. And then the eros love is more like an emotional type of love between two people. But uh, while they are not synonyms in any way, I think that we often draw too big of a distinction between them because they are used interchangeably at times. Um, so uh, I guess knowing that I'm, I'm cautious, I think it's helpful certainly to think about the three different types of, of love, but they are used interchangeably, and so I'm cautious about putting too much emphasis on the Greek here. I mean, if something is to be said, I think it's that Peter is saying to Jesus, that his love has proven admirable, but not necessarily self-sacrificial. Like, do you agape me? I, I phileo you. Do you agape me? I phileo you. Do you phileo me? Yeah, I phileo you. you know, it's like, it's admirable, but I, I haven't proven self-sacrificial for you. And what I, what I find interesting is the, the charcoal fire to me that really stood out. In John 18, 18, John said... It was around a charcoal fire that Peter denied Jesus three times. Uh, the smell of a charcoal fire that day on the beach probably brought back memories from a few nights ago where Peter had one of his darkest hours. But Jesus is doing something here, I think. Um, three times around a charcoal fire, he denied Jesus publicly. And now three times around a charcoal fire, he's affirming his love for Jesus. It's like Jesus is giving Peter a new charcoal memory. He's erasing the old one, replacing it with a new one. And you have to think that Peter looked at charcoal fire differently the rest of his life. I think it, it brought back the moments, the memory uh, of, the, of God doing a great work in him. Yes, it was a, great, a, a moment of great failure around a fire, but here it's a moment of restoration around a fire. It was that he got called into service again. And I think with us too, we all have moments in our life where God does great things. The moment you were saved, the moment you gave your life to Christ, whatever. Uh, the day God called you into service. You have very specific moments, I think, where, where God got through to you. And I think it's important to remember those moments. Remember where you were. Remember what it smelled like. Remember what it looked like. I mean, there's very graphic images in my mind of where I was when I got saved, where I was after that failure when God said, get back in the game, where I was when God s turned the direction in my life here or there, or, you know, there's different places that you and I are. Maybe it's in a church setting. Maybe it's in your vehicle. Maybe it's at home. Maybe it's wherever, in a tractor, out in the field. God says, do this or that. He gets a hold of you. You know what I mean? I think we need to remember those moments where God met us in the past because those are the moments when everything falls apart, when we fail Him, that we go back to. And we remember, God started this work in me. He's not going to quit. Okay, when I fail Him, I go back to the call. When things get difficult in the ministry, I go back to the call. I go back to my salvation. When, if life's hard, I go back to the joy of my salvation. Something like that. Um, it's also worth considering that if you've failed God in the past, to be on the lookout for opportunities to right that wrong. Right? Like, consider it a test. I failed him here last time, but not this time. 
It's a good reminder as well not to define somebody by one moment in their life and disregard all that the good that they have done. You know what I mean? I think we see this a lot today. It can be a coach, it can be a pastor, it can be a teacher, it can be whoever. And it's like, they say one thing wrong that we disagree with. They have one ill moment that's out of, characteristic, out of character for them. And then all of a sudden, people start writing them off. And you see the comments on social media, don't you? There's some very specific examples in my mind right now. He says this, now everybody's writing him off, pretending like he hasn't served the Lord Jesus his entire life. You know, and they're just going to write him off because of one, in, one out of character moment. I think we should be better than that. None of us, not one of us, want our story to be defined by one moment of weakness. It's worth thinking about. Think if we just, we just wrote off Peter because he denied the Lord three times. We wouldn't do that, would we? And that's part of the reason why this is here in John chapter 21. It's because we get to see Peter's restoration. And it's funny that Peter's rival, fun rival, John, um, is actually the one who writes about this. Because even though you see their rivalry throughout the Gospels, you see that they're still friends. But John still did make it to the tomb first, right? He beat him to the tomb. But John's, John is such a good friend that, he's, that he actually writes about Peter's restoration. I like that. We needed that. We'd, we'd get to the book of Acts and be all sorts of confused if we didn't have this chapter. But... Here's the thing. If, if we're living under a blanket of shame and guilt, thinking that we're too far gone, thinking that God can never use us, we're wrong. If that's your thinking, you're wrong. Because despite your failure, fellowship with Jesus is still available to you. He loves you. I would even say he wants to have that breakfast with you. He's going to say fellowship with you. He wants to have breakfast with you, right? What's the picture in the book of Revelation? He's knocking on the door, wanting to come in and, and, and have dinner with people. He wants to walk through the failure with you. And despite your failure, there's a job to do. There's a mission to accomplish and to tell the world about Jesus. Sure, there's... There's some moral failures that can keep you out of a church office or maybe from holding some sort of position in, in the church or elsewhere, but there is no failure, please listen, there is no failure that should ever put you on the bench or take you out of the game completely, ever. You have decided to follow Jesus. You are his disciple which means you always will be, even if you have a failure. Besides that, he's probably going to use that failure in a redemption story to advance the mission, right? If you respond to it properly, it's just going to help heal someone else who struggles later on. So, as his disciple, you have a mission to accomplish. You have disciples to make. You have a world to change. Are you going to fail him again? Yep. <laughs> you will. So you can't just let one failure take you out of the game. Peter, in the book of Galatians, has another failure. He's going to fail again. And Paul has to confront Peter. Who, Peter's acting hypocritically about the law and the Gentiles. Paul has to call him out on it. So, it's not the end of Peter's story either. Not, not in John 21, not in Galatians. Peter would eventually give his life for following Jesus. And history tells us that they crucified him upside down. And I think Jesus foretells this in verses 18 and 19. He says, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So Peter, you may have blown it this time. You did not show self-sacrificial love, but you will. In fact, a day is coming, Peter, when you will give your life for me and for my sake. And after Jesus says this, Peter looks back at, at John. Um, you can read the rest of the chapter. We're not going to for the sake of time. But, but Jesus foretells Peter's death, and he says, well, what about this guy, right? <laughs> John, uh, what about him? And, and Jesus is like, look, if I, if I want him to remain until I come, what's that to you? Who cares? You follow me. Don't worry about another disciple. Do what God is calling you to do. I think that's an important message that we need to understand. That's an important point. Sometimes you go into ministry with other people. Sometimes you go into ministry with family, with friends, whatever. They feel like the Lord's calling them this way. You feel like the Lord's calling you this way. Another way. You do what God calls you to do. We all are responsible individually before God to follow Him. I like that point. You follow me. I can't think of a better phrase to end our Easter series with. You follow me. I think that sums up what Easter means for us. We need to follow Jesus by yielding to our king. We follow Jesus by dying with the king. We die to sin. We take up our cross. And then we follow Jesus by living for him. We become like him. We help others to do the same. Well, in summary, the application this morning, the closing application, I can imagine that uh, some of us need to decide just to follow Jesus for the first time this morning. Uh, maybe you've, you've grown up in church or you've been coming to church for a while now. You've been listening to the message and, and uh, you've been learning. And, and that's great. But sometimes, sometime you have got to let God break through to your life, to your soul, to your heart. And you need to get to that point where you say, God, I'm in. All right, I've, I've heard enough. I can see you're trying to get my attention. Jesus, I'm in. I'm going to follow you. And I want you to know that right now, right where you sit, you can say to Jesus in your heart, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Today's the day. I want to pick up my cross. I want to follow you. And then I also understand there's some folks here who might have said that to the Lord before, but because of a failure in their, their walk with Jesus, or because of a failure in your walk with Jesus, you've put yourself on the bench like Peter. And you've got all these voices in your head telling you you're a mess. You're a washout, right? You're, God's done with you. How could he ever use you? And you need to let Jesus call you back into the game again. Let him call you back into the game again. He didn't put you on the bench. You put you on the bench. We need, look folks, we need the body of Christ. I would say the entire body of Christ involved to fulfill this mission. That's the goal. I want to see every man complete in Christ, fulfilling their mission that God gives them. And the question is not, can God use you? The question is, do you love Jesus? Do you love him? And if so, then follow him. Isn't that what he says? Follow me. 
Obey me. It doesn't matter what other people are doing. It doesn't matter what your friends are doing, other disciples are doing. It doesn't matter if one's, one's in Chadron, one's in Wyoming, one's in China, one's in Africa. Who cares? What is God calling you to do? What is he leading you to do? So the empty tomb means a new mission, but we have to rely on Jesus to fulfill the mission, but first we have to decide to just be part of the mission to begin with. We've got to decide to follow Jesus ourselves. Will you decide to follow Jesus? One of my favorite movies is, uh, they call it, it's The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. I don't know if you've seen it or not. If you do watch it, parents, be aware there's a couple tough spots. You might want to use Vid Angel or something like that to clean it up a bit. It's actually a pretty clean movie overall, com comparatively. But it's one of my favorite movies. And Walter is a photograph manager for Life magazine they're having their last issue and so but they lose this one photograph this one negative from the from the photographer who who's, who's infamous you know for his pictures and, and so he's kind of a mysterious unpredictable photographer he's he's a master photographer and, and but he's unpredictable. He doesn't have a cell phone. You never know where he's at. You've got to follow. And, and so basically, Walter has to, has to trace his steps to try to find the photographer to finish his work. He's got to find that last negative for the cover of Life magazine. And there's a point where he decides, I'm going to stop dreaming, <laughs> right? Because he's a daydreamer. He'll be standing there at work, and he'll just zone off. And people throw stuff at him because he's dreaming. He's dreaming about a life that he doesn't have, but it's a life that he wants. And he finds that as he's pursuing this crazy, adventurous, mysterious, unpredictable photographer, he's dreaming less because he's actually living it. I think sometimes as Christians, we, we dream, we think, we would love to follow Jesus. I'd love to do this. I'd love to do that. That's all we do, and we just think about it don't actually do it. And there's one point where he says, where the journey gets tough in following this guy. This guy's going to the Afghanistan, the mountains of Afghanistan to take pictures. And he's got to deal with the, you know, the, the, the terrorists and everything like that to get, to get to him. But he decides it's worth it. He says, because he's got to finish the master's work. He said, I don't care how tough it is, I'll hike through the Himalayas to go get this picture to finish his work. And he gets there, and it's funny because the photographer says, he's, he's looking around, he's waiting for a, a, to take a picture, but he looks over and he sees a soccer, uh, a game of soccer going on with the locals. And he says, that looks like fun. I'm going to go join them. But here he is, he's traveled all the way across the world, hiked through the Himalayas, and this photographer says, I'm going to go play soccer. You want to join? And he says, this is the part that always stands out to me. He says, we're going to be odd-numbered if you don't join. That says to me, we need everyone, right? Don't sit on the bench. Get in the game and have fun doing it. Enjoy serving God. We're going to be odd-numbered if you don't join. But you can't just daydream about it. you got to do it. you got to live it. And so as, we, uh, as the worship team comes up, um, we're going to sing a song, a very familiar song written by persecuted Christians. You know the words to this song. We're going to sing this a cappella. But it's... I've decided to follow Jesus. And let's all stand and sing this song. Let's just sing the first three, first, those three verses. But I only want you to sing if you've actually decided to follow Jesus. You can stand, you can sit, you can do whatever you want. But only sing if you've actually decided to follow Jesus this morning.
Let the words come from the heart. It's a very familiar song, but let's make a decision right here and right now this morning to follow him. Are we ready? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. For our last song this morning, we're going to, I, I think we're going to do um, Cry of My Heart. It stays on theme better than, the, than our final song actually did. So let's back up to that. Okay. Psalm 119, verse 149. Hear my voice. According to your loving kindness, revive me, O Lord, according to your ordinances. Let's get the first line up to make sure we got the right song here. Okay, here we go. Two, three, four. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, so I can walk in your truth. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, and make me wholly devoted to you. Ooh, it is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Open my eyes so I can see the wonderful things that you do. Open my heart up more and more and make it wholly devoted to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. All of the days of my life. All of the days of my life. Amen. Oh, yes, fellowship dinner, so let's stay and have some good food and fellowship today. <laughs>